well, let's go ahead and get started. I think we're, we're at that point. So I'd like to talk here about lab management and load testing. And this is, once again, part of the ALM engagement program. Uh, my name is Stephen Borg. I'm part of Northwest Cadence. And we'll talk lab management and load testing and do a Q&A. Um, I want to find out, though, a quick poll before we get going. Um, what's your primary interest? Just so I know where to spend the most time, um, which, which would be lab management, load testing, or both equally. I'll go ahead and put that poll page up there. I'm going to share those results. It's giving me grief on sharing the results, and I don't know why. Anyway, I'll just read the results out. It's uh, um, it, it's equally split: one lab management, one load testing, and then two both equally. So we're going to stick with uh, stick with kind of hitting them both and hitting them both pretty uh, pretty equally and pretty hard. So let's jump into those. And the lab management one, I don't want to spend a lot of time on slides because that's going to have to be demo mostly. So let's go back to our our content and lab management sits right here on Team Foundation Server. It definitely requires Team Foundation Server. And the ability to use lab management, Microsoft just recently announced they've included it as part of Visual Studio Ultimate. It used to be something you would have to pay for separately. You'd pay for by, per license or per uh, uh, machine. And now it's just included with Visual Studio Ultimate. So another reason, um, they just keep adding reasons for Visual Studio Ultimate. So the other thing is load testing, and where does that sit? Load testing sits um, right here in the ultimate SKU. So it's something that you do need ultimate to run when you want to do your load testing. Um, we can skip through some of these. Um, most of these we don't need to worry about, but I want to talk quickly about deployments. Deployments are complex, and if you've got test environments and you need to deploy more than one test environment, um, maybe for testing different versions of the code or something, that can be even more complex. Uh, virtualization helps that a lot, uh, but a lot of times managing that availability can be difficult, or spinning up and spinning down virtual machines on demand can be dim dim uh, difficult. Um, the other thing is that tests against complex environments are very often long running, and this can be days. Um, and we want to figure out a way that people don't have to compete for those environments. So if you and I are both testing the same application with the same environment, it wouldn't make sense for us to really, uh, you know, you install your application, you test for a day, then you tear it down, and I install my, my portion of the application or my version of the application. I test it for a while, then I uninstall and you reinstall. Too rough. So we want to be able to do something like network isolation that. So let's keep, keep moving on, however, and talk a little bit about lab management. Lab management ties everything together. So it's part of Team Foundation Server. It's a chunk of Team Foundation Server. Um, Microsoft Test Manager is the client for it, one client, and Visual Studio is another client. And it relies on System Center Virtual Machine Manager. So you do need SC VMM up and running to get this thing to work. Um, the Hyper-V host itself um, there's a library share. Let's get start with that. And we can store virtual machines in the library share inside of System Center Virtual Machine Manager. Now Hyper-V then is used to reach the, the, the lab management, tells the library to spin up Hyper-V machines. And those machines include things like a lab agent, a test agent, and a build agent. Um, there's a test controller and a build controller sit outside of this. There are tools that you can use when you automatically spin up a virtual machine to install these capabilities for you. But the idea is the takeaway. In order to use lab management, you not only need Visual Studio Ultimate and Team Foundation Server, you also need System Center Virtual Machine Manager and a Hyper-V environment. It doesn't have to be a giant Hyper-V environment, but you do need a Hyper-V environment. 
Um, although System Center VMM can handle um, VMware hyper VMware machines, uh, lab management cannot. So you do need a Hyper V infrastructure. So some of the the, the there's a lot of challenges in setting this up. Um, uh, the benefits are once it is set up and you have your environment set up, you can improve developer productivity by, by letting people just fire these things off and, and, and building them very quickly and improve the, your workflow, your overall workflow. I've been in organizations and, and worked with organizations where when testers needed a build, it took up to a week to get a build deployed into their test environments. Um, that's admittedly on the outside very, very uncommon. Um, that's a really long time. Uh, but most places, when a dev needs a new build or wants the new build, it is, it is most common that it takes four hours to a day to get that build out there. And that's too long for that tester to wait um, to get the builds. They end up testing things they shouldn't be testing or going back and testing lower priority things because of that. We want to be able to get them testing those. Um, we want to be able to get our multi-tier applications deployed quickly and get our build environments on a clean slate. Um, this happens all the time. Someone goes out to the test environment, they deploy their app to it and, and it doesn't work and they go, oh, I forgot the stored proc. So they open up SQL Server um, Management Studio, they go right over and they add the stored proc directly to the test environment. Um, and then uh, all of the tests work. Everything works for the next, you know, three, four, five weeks, six weeks, well, however long your your deployment cycle is. And then you go out to staging, and it breaks again because people forgot to bring that and put that stored proc back into version control, so it auto automatically get deployed to its new areas. So let's move down more payoffs. <laughs> um, reproing a bug. This. Bytes. And most of you were there to see me um, run the manual tester. One thing I didn't show is there's a screenshot utility. I just reach over and click it, and it takes a screenshot. And in addition to that, right next to that button, there's a button that allows me to take a, not a screenshot, but a sna snapshot of the entire virtual environment. And then a developer can, at any time, it, it, it'll attach, it attaches a link to that on any bugs I file. So if I have a nasty bug, I can attach the entire snapshot of the virtual environment. And when the developer gets it, they can click on that link and it will actually open them up a, um, a browser environment that allows them to browse into the actual development environment. The, I mean, the, the actual test environment. And by the actual test environment, I mean the test environment as it existed the moment that developer clicked that button. So if the SQL Server was having performance issues because of lack of memory, you would see that immediately, et cetera. So that can, that can help on the no more, no repro, especially things that are very difficult to repro. And the interesting thing is it's a network isolated environment. So if a tester has that same environment up and running somewhere else and they are concurrently running tests against it, when a developer spins up that whole environment, they don't have to do anything. They spin up that environment, they don't have to take down the test environment. It's a completely isolated environment, even though it shares the same IP addresses and the same machine names and all of the other ones. And it does it through something called network isolation. So that's a, a, several of the powerful tools. Here's an example. You know, here you've got the two things, same machine names, same IP addresses. But, but lab management throws it into an internal network and gives distinct external IP addresses that we can work with, that we can work with. So improved quality, improved relationships, etc. So let's take a look at that. And before we go to load testing, I want to actually jump in. And this takes a little bit of time to run. So um, I want to I want to get it started. Uh, we may actually flip back to. Uh, oops. We may actually flip back to um, do a little load testing while this is running, but maybe not. First thing I wanted to show is System Center Virtual Machine Manager. So here I am in SCVMM, and notice I've got a couple lab machines. They've got these GUIDs attached to the end of them. These are the lab machines that I have up and running um, for my, uh, my, my demonstration I'm about to give. 
Now notice my machines are already running. Now because they're already running, um, what's going to happen is those running machines, I mean if they weren't, it'll speed up my ability to get at them and run this demo. Um, it takes about 45 minutes otherwise if I need to spin up those machines because it actually has to copy them from a library, spin them up active, give them new machine names, go through this entire fairly substantial process to get these spun up. So I'm gonna, I've already spun them up for us. Um, you can see in our library we have um, our templates and here's our Tailspin Lab um, thing. We can look at our MS our, our libraries, we've got templates for our virtual machines, etc. I'm not going to dive into this in a lot of detail, so we're just going to stick to it um, as, as a pretty small detail. What I would like to show you is this is the Microsoft Environment Viewer. So you can see Tailspin Toys is currently up and running, and I can go into Tailspin Toys here and I can I can delete what's running on it. I can go into the server. This is the server that's running the back end. I can see various snapshots. And, and look, if you see here, I'm in the post-deployment compile of Tailspin Toys now. I also have a snapshot called Clean Slate. And I may want to roll back to that snapshot. And by the way, that snapshot is for the entire environment, both of these at the same time. Um, that's kind of critical. So I could then remote, uh, not remote, but I can go into these machines. You can see I can start, um, run various pieces in here, look at the machines, do whatever it is I want to do. I could also fire up IE from within those. Let's look at this from the lab center. So if I'm, this is my, this is my test um, professional. Um, this, you, you most likely have seen it before in the testing center where we have our test plans, but I'm overusing the lab center. It's a way for me to understand it. And if I look here, here's my Tailspin multi-machine environment. And I've got the Tailspin server and the Tailspin client. Both of those are running. I also have a separate single server Tailspin environment, but I don't want to use that environment. I want to use the more complex environment for this demo. Um, we can deploy a new environment from the library. Notice I can say, please deploy the Tailspin um, multi-machine environment. This allows me to just say, bang deploy this entire environment for me. Um, this is how easy it is for a tester to get a new test environment um, as long as they have permission to do so. Um, I'm going to don't deploy. I don't need to deploy that one. Um, we can go in create new um, virtual environments. These are from a template in the library. So I can come in and create a brand new virtual environment and specify which machines I want to pull from this and add those machines to the environments. Um, I can compose a brand new environment. These are machines that happen to already be deployed on the host. So here are the host. I could say, I have a brand new environment I want to compose, and I want it to be the dom uh, matrix domain controller, um, this TFS 2010 MSFT tool, and standalone 2010. I can add all of those to the environment. These are machines that currently are executing. Or I can create a brand new environment that's made up of physical machines. and these. Physical machines are machines that are either physical machines or are virtual machines not under the control of lab manager. Okay, good enough. We need to get started on this thing. So let's go in here and um, we can close up all of these things here. I've got under Tailspin, I've got several builds. And one of these is to simply compile Tailspin. And another is to build, deploy, and test my two-tier tail, tailspin. I'm going to queue a new build and get it started right away. And then I'm going to open it up and we can look at it. But what this build is going to do, it's actually, I'm running for one second now. It normally runs for about 9.6 minutes, 10.7 minutes, somewhere along that time frame to continue the entire build. But what it does, it's going to... If build is needed, do a build. Start the build workflow. And it's going to call compile tailspin. That's the build it's going to compile. And if I go in and I edit this uh, build definition, notice that it has triggers, etc., workspaces, build defaults, all of that. But the process itself is very, very simple. It simply just says, what are the lab process settings? I'm going to edit it. And it says, what build environment do we want to use? The multi-machine environment. Do you have a snapshot? Please revert back to the clean slate snapshot, which I showed you earlier. For the build, we want to call compile tiles, tailspin, and we want to queue a new build. You could also say, don't queue a new build. I want you to use an existing compilation. Use this older version. 
build this older version in the mixed platforms debug and just deploy it. Or I could actually go out and provide a specified location and grab that build. Um, I'm going to have it do a complete new build normally. And then how do we deploy it? And we deploy to the Tailspin client this way, to the Tailspin ter servers this way, and we have build scripts, and these happen to just be batch files, just command scripts, to actually do the deployment. And um, most commonly people just use PowerShell scripts for deployment here or, or something else, but it's just scripts that run. And then take a snapshot after deploying the build and before running the tests, so you can roll back to that snapshot. Um, then there's tests. What tests do we want to run? I want to run all of these tests. My Tailspin test plan, and there anything in the automated test suite, and I want to run for this test configuration with these test settings. And that's it. And it'll run the whole thing. So you basically just configure it, and right now it's actually running that build. Let's go look at the build itself. I don't want to miss it, anything. Okay, restore snapshot. If deployment is needed, do deployment. Let's jump out here and look now at the environment. Um, notice it says, hey, there, view some details. There's some additional info for me. When I view it, it says that the testing capability configuration is in progress, and it's configuring the workflow capability on this machine. These are things that it's doing right now. If we go look at the snapshots, note that it is rolled back to clean slate one, and that's where the now is. So it's at clean slate now. Um, if we scroll across, um, we don't have any builds today. This, is, this was on the 19th, was the last build. So we're going to get another post-deployment snapshot once it finishes deploying the application. But what it's doing right now is it's configuring the workflow capabilities on these machines. So we can actually go into each machine if we want. Let's close this. Go into each machine and look at the machine itself. Um, it's currently doing a bunch of stuff. Um, looking at the server is going to be boring, boring, boring because nothing's happening there. But here you'll see the client, and when the tests start running, the automated tests, you'll see the UI appear here and actually run. So now we just need to let this thing run. And we can check out where it is. It's currently waiting for the workflow capability to be ready so it can do the deployment, that is, run those three deployment scripts. Now, I have a question. It's a perfect time to start answering some of these questions. Can you use install shield as a deploy script? You can use anything you want as a deploy script, anything that can be called from the command line. Uh, people use Perl, people use Python, people use pretty much anything. Um, I love PowerShell. That's my favorite scripting environment right now. I, I think it's, a, it's an extremely elegant one um, and also very powerful. Um, failing that, I like to use Python, but you could certainly use Install Shield to deploy script. Any other questions? We're still waiting for the workflow capability to be ready. It's been running for 4.4 minutes. Um, it needs to run about 10 minutes, so we have about five minutes still in this development workflow. Well, I got a good question for you then. Sure, fire away. Um, did you have, uh, so in this build definition, uh, right now I don't have Lab Manager uh, set up at all, but I do have a build that's set up and drops to a, to a folder. I've been looking into uh, changing the, the uh, build definition template in order to have a deployment, a, a deploy if, if uh, build successful stage to it. What you showed me there in the build definition properties was, gosh, after this build succeeds, go in and, and uh, run these particular scripts to deploy. Correct. Is that something that you customized your uh, build definition template to add in, or is that something that got added in by Lab Manager? It got added in by Lab Manager. So in fact, if I go and look at the build, let me go in to customize one of these builds, um, edit the build definition, and when you go to the process, you'll notice it's the lab default template.xaml. Uh, yes. And you actually already have it, even if you don't have Lab Manager installed. Normally you have the default template or the upgrade template are the ones that are used. But the lab default template is also included. So all you would need to do is switch it to that lab default template when you have it there, once you have the, the lab there and up and running. 
Let me go back and just make sure I'm not missing out on, on, on any deployments. Running the deployment scripts. Uh-oh. I had a problem running the deployment scripts. There was a trust relationship between the primary domain that failed. Um, but that seems this one seems to be working. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. In just a moment, let's go back to our um, view of the machines. Here's our Tailspin server. Um, we can hit Start, All Programs, um, SQL Server Management Studio. And we could, uh, I don't have SSMS on this one. So I can't go in and actually check to see if it's deploying. I'm going to go back to the client to make sure that it's going to run those tests. Um, fingers crossed it'll run the tests. Okay, right now it's taking the post deployment snapshot. So if I go and I look at that again and I pull over to snapshots, um, it's taking a snapshot right now of those virtual machines. And we don't have any information right now, no info thing, so we're okay. Let's go back to machines. The snapshot hasn't started to be taken yet. Oh, it's done taking the snapshot. our snapshot? No. Still hasn't shown us our snapshot. But it says it's completed with the snapshot. We might need to do a refresh over here. Yep, there we go. Post deployment snapshot right there. It grabbed our new snapshot. This is now where we're at. Let's go back to our machines. Make sure we're looking at the client because if you notice over here, it's waiting for the test capabilities to be ready and now it's running those tests. So let's go over here and make sure, yep, here we go. We can watch it running our automated tests. It's opening up tailspin.web. This is a different Tailspin application than we saw earlier. It's kind of an older version of it. But it's one that takes just as long to load, especially on this poor little mach virtual machine, which I believe only has a gig of RAM assigned to it. By the way, you can look at this full screen as well if you want to dive into it. Um, you can, of course, view it full screen. But we're going to watch it walk through its tests. And looks like we're in good shape for timing. Nice. We're going to get a chance to jump into some load testing and see that um, probably as deeply as we're seeing the lab management portion. Okay, it's downloading everything. Um, don't expect these automated tests after a deploy to run very fast, um, especially if you don't if your hyper if your Hyper V infrastructure isn't very um, uh, robust. It would be really nice if this was running against fast hard drives or a SAN. This is right now just running against standard SATA two drives. Okay, I'm just going to add this item to the cart. By the way, and I love this, when all these tests are running, look at it added it to the cart. The total price was $50. Hmm, seems that that one should be more expensive, but uh, good enough. Um, when it's running these tests, like it's doing and executing these, it can be taking a video, it can be gathering IntelliTrace data, it can be gathering machine information, so that when it files a bug, you have some deep, deep information about it. So let's go back and take a look at where the build is. Okay, the build had a problem. There was a build trust relationship between this workstation and the primary domain, but yet it still was able to deploy the application, take a snapshot, um, and run it. We had one failed test. Let's view the test results. We can see the, the tests here. Um, the buy an airplane failed. And let's uh, view those results. And it looks like when we went to buy an airplane, we have all of, all of this data about it. And uh, th these are all the historical results. Let's look at the today's results. Um, we had a failure. And the failure was assert.r equal failed. We expected it to come back at $60. The actual cost was $50. So we have 
a problem with, with this test. And here's the failure of this run that just had. So we can create a bug from this. So here's the workflow. I come in in the morning. There was a test that failed. My builds all ran successfully, but my test failed. I open up the test results that failed. I go to buy an airplane, and I create a bug from that, if I choose to create a bug. Now, I've been gathering a lot of data from it. And this bug could be um, cost of airplane is wrong. And if I go to system info, notice I have all of the system information from each machine. So here's the computer name, the domain, and all of the errors that occurred in that machine. Um, it was it, That machine has a grand total of 511 megabytes of RAM. Um, the total virtual memory is 2 megabytes of RAM, so clearly we have a problem here, 2 gigabytes. Um, that could be the cause of it being slow. It's resolution. I've got all of this type of data. I've got the test case that it was running when it failed. Um, I've got all of my links, and some of my links are my test results, my tricks file. I have buy an airplane and verify total PNG. I'm going to open that up, and you'll notice that it shows me it found the step that failed, and it took a screenshot at that moment in time. The test failed, it took a screenshot. This is an automated run, and the bug it gives me that I created from it has that screenshot on it. In addition, it's got a video of that entire log. I also have it configured to show me um, the event logs. So I have a complete event log. And here is, for me, a massive kicker. Check this out. I have got an IntelliTrace file. So I can open it up and, whoops, I don't open it up in here. A developer can open it up in Visual Studio and they can find the test step where it failed. Look at the test data. And we have several things. Buy an airplane and verify the total. Um, no steps were collected for it, but they could start debugging and literally start stepping through the code at the moment it failed and go back and forth stepping through the code of an automated test run because I have the IntelliTrace log. I can see all these exceptions that were thrown, etc. I'm, I'm gathering not much data in this IntelliTrace just for performance reasons, but, I, but it's, it's darn potent. So I've got all of this data and the ability to do IntelliTrace right from within this test run, from that bug. So let's save and close the bug. Somebody can now go work on that bug if they, if they so choose to. OK. That, in a nutshell, is what um, lab management is all about. Um, one other thing, when I'm running a test, I've got the, you know, I can take a snapshot so I can create things and spin them up in an isolated environment. I can also go over here to the lab center and as a developer, I mean as a tester, I can deploy a new environment. I can say give me a new isolated environment for Tailspin and quickly simply click deploy and it'll actually just go build it for me. There's, it's just, it is hard to get configured. I, I'm not going to lie to you. This is non-trivial to get configured and up and running right. Um, but once it is up and running, I need the ability to just say, give me this environment in an isolated fashion, deploy everything into it, and let me go in and test is powerful um, and very, very useful. OK, enough of my uh, standing on my soapbox here. Let's close out this. We can close this. Um, we no longer need this. Let's go back to take a look at load testing. Looks like we've taken up about half our time on lab management. Before I move off of lab management, do we have any questions on lab management? So once you've created a set of uh, VMs, let's say you, you need a, a database, an IIS server, and um, uh, two clients, one XP, one Win Center, or something like that. Yep. Uh, once you've got those base VMs set up um, and created within uh, Yep, that's exactly right. Every one of those. The hard thing, the hard thing is getting the virtual machines built and getting the lab management infrastructure up and running appropriately. There's, um, it, it, it's not as easy as running like the TFS setup and configuration wizard. 
it actually requires you know it, it, yeah, it's it's a much bigger process um, our first implementation with the beta 1 lab manager took way too long but beta 1 was so bad um, it, in fact it took us inviting Microsoft into our network we gave um, some Microsoft employees domain accounts and they came in and helped us set it up um, from India they'd come in at night and uh, and work on configuring it and it took a couple weeks um, down to beta 2 where we did it internally ourselves um, and we did it in about three days one person three days down to the final release where we can set up an environment in about two days a day and a half one person that's to set up the whole thing from scratch set up the you know install SCVMM the whole gamut In a bigger, more complicated environment, it could take more time. It's it's a big investment too. I mean, really, to get this thing to work, you need a, a Hyper-V infrastructure, and you need System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And if you have nothing set up now, that in, that involves buying a very expensive machine um, or set of machines to run these things. I guess I shouldn't say very expensive, but you know, if you want if you want performance, you'll need to run it on a SAN, and you'll need to have some pretty large um, amounts of storage space to run it effectively. Probably as well, ten to ten to twenty thousand dollars to give you a nice yeah yeah machine hub that, environment. That's kind of what you're talking the ten to twenty thousand dollar environment. I mean, you can build one that works just great if you on a budget, just by using a bunch of SATA drives. Uh, we did it internally with just a bunch of SATA drives, um, and it works fine you can see it. it it runs it up but but it doesn't the performance isn't good enough for your testers to really get in and fire up lots of machines and, and run their tests against it in that case you kind of want a, a little bit better environment for that but if you're an enterprise that already has one you can do that. uh, that's around yeah two thousand bucks two to three thousand dollars to do that setup no raid array no no happy speedy vms etc yep exactly now one thing you can do to speed <laughs> what was that? Oh, say again. I missed it. Oh, if you're if you're going that route or you have uh, RAM constraints, use Windows XP for your test clients because right. they take about half the amount of RAM that you need for a Vista or, or Win Seven. Right. Exactly. Windows XP requires very little for your test clients. Um, okay. The other thing you can do to speed things up pretty dramatically is you can tell um, SCVMM where you want to deploy things, and you can just get like three or four relatively small um, SSD drives. Those are blazingly fast and and just you know with with a thousand dollar investment in some SSD drives you can actually get things that uh, you can get uh, pretty decent performance. So, But they're very expensive so you can't run lots of virtual machines at the same time. So let's talk about load testing. Why do you want to do load testing? Um, performance testing is one of the key reasons we want, to, we want to know that we get correct operation when we have our expected load, that we get our response times, we get scalability. You also may want to do it to seek out resource limitations, um, like run, take a long running test, and with load tests it's not uncommon to run those things for 24 hours or 48 hours, just to see do we have memory leaks, do we have problems with resource management, etc. And then of course stress testing which is you just keep piling on the users as though you have an ad in the Super Bowl and you see what happens. Right? Find out how it fails. Does it fail by rejecting users and telling people to come back later? Does it fail by throwing exceptions and providing bad, bad data back to people? How does it fail? What's the, what's the cause of the failure? And that's a, those are all very good uses for load testing. So with Visual Studio 2010, it's very similar to the load testing agents in 2008. There have been some improvements, um, but they're very much feature improvements, not structural improvements. So what we have is you've got a test agent um, that can collect information, collect IntelliTrace information. You have test agents that are going to run the test and collect data on the client another test agent that may be deployed to collect data on the database server and another test agent to collect data running on the client. So we've got lots of test agents and test agents do a lot of different things. One is they actually run the test but the other is they collect 
test data, and that's new to 2010. Um, you also have the test controller that manages all the test agents. So what happens is we're going to take our existing tests for load tests. Generally, they're going to be web tests. That have, now they're called web performance tests, not user interface tests, not coded UI tests. And the reason is a coded UI test will actually spin up an instance of Internet Explorer. Well, that takes 50 megabytes, just bang, you know, right off, just boom, just for loading it, right? You've lost 50 megabytes. You can't run a thousand users. That would be 50 gigabytes of data you'd have to have on that machine as memory. So you really can't load test coded UI tests very well. So what you run is something similar to a coded UI test, but that is just doing a web request, web response, and that's a web performance test. We'll see that in just a moment. And then think about other machine elements, your memory and CPU, what logging requirements you have, and I'll show you how to do that as part of a demonstration. And this one is easier just to run as a demonstration. So um, let's go into one of my uh, remote boxes, and uh, it's currently in use for something else. Let me just close this current solution, close any um, anything we've got. And I want to build a new load test. And I could load test, for instance, Tailspin Toys. So I've got my Tailspin Toys application up. And I could, I want to create a few web tests to test it. So things like um, go to model airplanes, click on fourth copy flyer, click on paper airplanes, add something to the cart, um, delete something from the cart, whatever it is I want to do, I want to test this application. So let's go in and actually give it a shot at testing this Tailspin Toys application. So for my load tests, I, I don't know, do I want to open up IE as part of it? Who knows? Um, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just going to be a web request anyway. So let's go in and say file, or sorry, test, new test, and I'm going to create a couple web performance tests. Now, I want to stress, you don't have to just test websites with this. If you're testing web services, use a bunch of unit tests. Just use it, use unit tests to test your web services. You know, they'll create a proxy and you can load test your web services. Um, but we're gonna use a web test because this is the more traditional load test. And we'll call this web can test. You, yes. Can you, can you switch the screen? I'm still seeing demo load testing. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Um, whew. Do not want to miss that. Um, a huge apologies there. Let me go in and share. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So, so now I'm in browsing my, my web test. It's, you lost it again. It's coming back up in just a second. There it goes. So I will say this is browse site dot web test. And this web test our new project is going to be uh, Tailspin Tests, Tailspin Web Tests. Create this project. And it simply brings me up to a browser and then lets me work with it. So let's just go to Tailspin Toys. Next thing I want to do is I want to look at model airplanes. You'll see it just keeps adding things. Look at the fourth coffee flyer. That's a nice thing. Go back to model airplanes. Look at the Trey Research Rocket. That's a beautiful model airplane as well. Um, might want to scroll over. Let's look at paper airplanes. The Contoso Cloud Explorer. Ooh, I might also like the Worldwide Importer. I'm just browsing through these. By the way, I, I really ought to be um, spending time to read what's on the page because it's also recording my think times. But now I'm done go back to my model airplanes, maybe go back to home, and I'm done recording this test. So I'm going to push stop. That will stop recording the test. It's going to detect dynamic parameters. So it's going to go look at um, any parameters which might have been auto-generated um, through things like um, a JavaScript, and we're good. This We now have our website, browse website, that's passing. So let's actually run that test and see what it looks like to run it. Now to run it, it's going to just execute all these things as fast as it possibly can. 
and notice we get statuses da -da 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 -da, all the way across. Test is still in progress right now. It's just gathering data because it's gone to the last one. And at any point, I can I can click on this web. I have the web test, which is the definition of the test, and browsing the site. And I can look here and see what is the request, what was the response, what does the context look like, were there any details, did we meet our response time goal, etc. Um, all of those things. Plus I can look at the web browser itself. Our hottest paper airplanes. Notice it's not doing any layouts here. Don't know why. Let's open it up and see if it was able to get my styles.css. It was. It's got my, uh, yeah, looks like it's got all of the various pieces, so don't know why it's not displaying nicely, but it doesn't really matter because that's our browse the site web test. So now let's go back and let's add another test, another web performance test, and this will be purchase stuff .web test. And we're gonna run purchase stuff .web test, and we're gonna go to Tailspin Toys, we're gonna go to model airplanes, look at fourth coffee flyer, read about it, love it, click add to cart, Maybe go look at some paper airplanes. Look at the Contoso Cloud Explorer. Love it. Add it to the cart. Uh, I don't have any discount coupons, so let's just go to checkout. Enter some data. Um, Review the order. I've got my credit card number with my security code already pre-populated. Send it UPS ground and place the order. And I've got my order. Yay! And now I have zero items in my cart. My order is placed. We can stop this test. Detect any dynamic parameters. And it can sometimes run into issues detecting dynamic parameters. Uh, the things that you need to go and correct. Um, but we'll see in this case if it can grab it. Yeah, it failed. Um, so it wasn't able to detect all of the dynamic parameters. Um, we can view the results on that. It actually does a run for that. And it was right here where it generated this receipt, this receipt number here. Um, it couldn't figure out how that receipt was auto-generated. Um, so that's, that's unfortunate. That'll mean all of my test steps will fail. So this order payment piece, um, I need to figure out and work through how do I get that order payment to work? And was it payment? Let me just make sure that that's where the failure occurred. It was under payment, yep, because it couldn't get this GUID piece here. To, couldn't understand that. So let's go back to purchase web stuff. And that's because when I was running through the test, it was running all of the JavaScript. When I'm replaying it, it can't have access to that JavaScript. So that means that I am going to need to go into this, and for some of the form post parameters and then some response things, I'm going to have to actually um, tell it what I want it to, to return. And I'm going to have to data bind it, basically, with the database. Um, that's too difficult for me, so I'm going to, uh, to do right now. So in my web test, I'm going to simply say, we're not going to call um, anything. We're just going to get to finalize. And then let's run it and see if that works. And it runs all the way up to that, to the finalize method. And it's doing the last submission and closing up the test. And the test is looks like passing. Yep, so our test passed. I wanted to have two passing tests for this. Now I have my two web tests. Now we're going to go in and we're going to create a load test based on those. So a load test, and this will be, we'll just call this like normal usage. And a load test walks through a wizard. We need to set up a wizard to go through these load tests. So we're going to start off, we can give a scenario. My scenario here will be my foo scenario or whatever, just, or just normal usage. You can have multiple scenarios in a single load test. But the think time profile for this scenario, use recorded think times. Don't use think times. In other words, just blaze through this as fast as possible. You may want to choose this if you're doing um, load um, stress testing because what you can do is with very few um, users, 
you can completely overwhelm a website. So let's use a normal distribution centered around the recorded think times. We need to set up a load pattern, a constant load. We could just say, you know, just use 25 users for, you know, three hours. Or we could do a step load. We could say start with 10 users. Every 10 seconds, add 10 more users to a maximum of 200 users. Let's do a maximum of uh, 100 users. Um, what's our test mix? Do we want to base it on the total number of tests? That means what we want is we want the browsing amount, we want to run the browsing test 65 or let's say 95 percent of the time and we want to run the purchase an item 5 percent of the time. So one in 20 users actually goes and buys something. Everyone else is lots, lots of browsing activity on the site. Or do we want to base it on the number of virtual users? So this could say I've got several users um, and the number of users that are doing test A is 75% and the number using test B are 25%. Um, this one wouldn't be as effective as this one because this one says our users, some users are just browsing, some users are purchasing then browsing, some are browsing then purchasing. This is much better than the number of virtual users where each user runs only a single test. Now what we may want to use the number of virtual users for is if our test mix has people shopping and buying stuff and other people who are administering the site like adding new um, you know, new products to the site. You could also base it on a user pace um, and based on a sequential test order like we always browse then we purchase browse purchase browse purchase browse purchase we're gonna base it on the total number of tests for ours this is the best one um, I you can read more about how to do this I'm gonna look I'm gonna add some tests that I want to run and I want both browse and purchase stuff in this test run and I want the browse site to make up let's say 92 percent of my activity and 8 percent will be purchase stuff go next what type of environments are people shopping with? Um, there's a lot of people on an intercontinental WAN, um, people coming in on 3G, lots of people coming in on cable modems, but um, there's some people that are coming in on a dial-up modem. Very few people, only 3% of folks. Most people, or a lot of people are coming in on 3G, we have a lot of mobile users, and the rest are coming in at some pretty substantial DSL speeds, and then you've got a few slower speeds. Click next. What browsers are people using? Um, Internet Explorer 7, Firefox, Chrome, and Internet Explorer 8. Uh, most people are coming in on 8, followed by Firefox, and then very few people on IE7 and lots of people on Chrome. And you can get this distribution by looking at your IIS logs. Um, next thing we care about are the counter sets. Now we start getting into what we want to measure. Before the setup was how should our test run? And now we're going to say, what do we want to measure? So I'm going to add a computer to this. Now this computer name, um, we'll call it Foo for now. I, I don't actually have a computer named Foo on the network. Um, but this would you provide the name of the thing. And then you'd say, what kind of data do we want to capture? Um, it's our IIS server and our SQL server. So we want to gather those performance metrics, both IIS and SQL, from the Foo machine. The load test duration, we're going to have a 30 second warm up period. We're going to have a run duration of three minutes. Do we have time for three minutes? Yes, we do. And we have a sampling rate of every 10 seconds. And let's finish this run. Now, down here, I have the counter sets that I want. I want to catch, capture IIS and I want to capture SQL as the two counter sets from the foo data. Well, I actually don't have a foo machine, but you can go in here to these counter sets and you can manage it here. You can remove this whole computer, which I'm actually going to remove this computer. We don't need it. But inside of those counter sets, like in the IIS and the SQL counter sets, we can say what data do we want to capture? We can say, you know, we don't need SQL server access methods. We don't need buffer partition. Um, we don't need the number of latches and locks. So we can get rid of some of these performance counters that we don't want to capture. For IIS, what types of things do we want to capture? Active server pages, web services calls, process system, physical disk, do we want to measure network interface? What do we want to capture? 
I can get rid of active server pages, for instance, or leave it in there. These are the things I want to measure. I'm um, down here on my controller settings, my controller machine. I want to manage the counter sets there, and because I am running them locally, uh, let me add a computer. What? Um, just one moment. I'm going to copy this computer name because I certainly don't want to have to remember to retype it. And let's go back and add a computer, and we'll use um, a real computer, and we'll gather some IIS and some SQL data from it, or just some IIS data from it. Click OK, and it'll gather that IIS data that we want. Now, one thing that we had um, that I need to go back to, we now know the counter sets. And these counters, by the way, these are machines that can be across your network. And now let's say that you are absolutely certain that your SQL Server is going to be your constraint because you ran a big test before it. You can go in to your, um, let's see, test mix browser, step load pattern, and you can change the load pattern here. You can't do it in the wizard, but here you can change it from step to goal based. You could say, I want you to use the processor on the SQL Server because I know the SQL Server is processor bound. And I want it to. I want you to drive it between 70 to 90 percent processor utilization on that machine. I want the initial user count to be 10, the maximum a thousand, and every five seconds I want you to add another. Or, or sorry, every. Uh, um, where is it? Every time you measure, which is in our case 10 seconds, if I'm below 70% processor utilization, I want you to add five more users. So this can be any machine on your network, and then it will scale up, scale down, scale up, scale down, depending on um, the whether or not you're between these two bounds, 70 90% on this particular performance counter. Now, I'm not going to use goal based. Um, it's easier to look at something like step-based, where we had our 10, our maximum user count is 100, and we're going to ramp up. So let's save our load test and then run it. And when we run our load test, it's gathering a bunch of data. Now, while it's running, we can watch it. And uh, But I want to stress, I'm running it right now within Visual Studio Ultimate which provides me with the load testing, but that gives me a maximum of, I believe, 250 users. Does not give me more than 250 users. So if I want to use more than 250 users against my website, I need to do something different. I need to go in and purchase um, lab agents. And when you go to configure your lab agents, I'm not going to configure them, but when you have your your test agent, your test controller that you've already deployed if you're doing any type of testing, your test controller, um, you can simply on that one, when you open it up, it says, I'd like to assign users. And you open it up and you click and you'd say, I'd like to, to let this test controller control 5,000 users. And then it opens up a screen and it says, please enter the um, your um, code, which allows you, which is basically that you've purchased in 1,000 user increments, um, users. And you just say, OK, here are the 5,000 users. You enter your five codes. You have 5,000 users that you can now use. Meanwhile, our test is currently running. And this test is running locally right here. So if I look here, you can see some of these things. If I highlight it, I can see this is my overall user load. And it's increasing every 10 seconds. You can see that, the, that I'm increasing my user load. My last was 60 users. Now it's 70. So it keeps progressing upward. I can click on this green line. This is the number of pages per second that I'm returning. Um, my minimum pages per second on any measurement was 6.6 .6 pages per second. But my average has been 8.8 .8 pages per second. The average page time, if I click here, you'll see it highlighted here has really been only um, point on average 0 0.018 seconds. I'm returning those pages pretty quickly. My errors per second, my threshold violation, not that big a deal. Now let's go and look at, rather than page response time, I want to look at the system under test and look at my processor utilization. That's right here. So you can see my processor utilization has never gone above uh, 20, 
about uh, 28.5, 46%. Here we had a big spike in processor utilization with a corresponding decline in the bytes per second total. Maybe we're doing more purchasing now. Maybe we've reached our 100 users. Maybe something's going on. Maybe we have a memory leak somewhere. Who knows? But I can see then also look at the controllers and agents. I need to look at the controllers and agents to understand whether or not they're overloaded. Because if a controller and an agent is overloaded, then you can run into difficulty there as well. Now I have a question. Let me go up and manage the question while this continues to run. Um, is lab manager required to run load tests? No, it is not. Um, you can, and in fact, um, it, it, they're, they're completely separate tools, so you do not need to have lab manager at all to run load tests. Did that answer your question, Steve? If not, let me know. Now, you could use Lab Manager in theory to spin up your test environments that you're going to load test against. But in general, they are completely two different techniques. Um, you can use Lab Manager, or I'm sorry, not Lab Manager, you can use load testing um, in place of Load Runner. Um, load Runner is a tool, um, a very popular Load Runner tool, or load testing tool. Um, it also happens to be about eight times the price of the, the, the lab management tools here. In my experience, very few companies use all of the powerful features that lab, that, that test, that load runner has available to you. Um, I think that the testing tools that Microsoft offers hit about 80 to 90 percent of the functionality, maybe a little bit higher, of what LoadRunner offers. And that seems to be the sweet spot. Most people that use LoadRunner aren't using it at that level that they need to pay that additional you know, eight times as much money to get the benefit of a couple of the advanced features in LoadRunner that the chances are they're not using. I'm just going to throw that in. It's a little bit of editorializing, but I, I'm pretty... I'm pretty sold on a lot of the ways that, that, the, that the load runner here works for your basic load testing, and it's pretty potent as well. So now you've seen, we've walked through all of these things. Uh, one thing it popped up, and it said, you know, we didn't store any of our lab um, results. Um, I have it set not to store those. You can set it up to store details about every single web request. Um, it's not uncommon for that to reach uh, 50, 200, 500 gigabytes, one or two terabytes of data um, over the course of you know, a long run if you do that kind of data gathering. Most people prefer just to gather averages, so they, they gather just the average page response times and the highs and the lows. Um, we can look at all of our counters. We can view any of our, our pages. Here's my key indicators. I can look at my page response time, see what's what's going on down here, look at all those various pieces. Um, again, you can, you can look at test response time, how fast did the tests respond. Um, the test did a pretty good job. I didn't have any problems with my test responses, so I, I can have pretty much confidence. The test completed. Let's look at there was an error. Um, and all of the tests passed. None of the tests failed, but I did have an error. The load test result store type is database but the test results repository connect string has not been specified. So I told it to store it in a database, but uh, I didn't give it a database connection string, so it's not stored there. That's the only error I have. Everything else went swimmingly. So I might have wanted to jump that up to maybe 400 users or 1,000 users to see how it happens at that point in time. And that is load testing in a nutshell. Any questions on load testing or lab management. I've got a load test question for you. Sure, fire away. The um, data, if you, store, if you store the data, uh, where is it stored and how do you compare historical runs to say, gosh, my, my load test results were uh, doing about this for, for performance now, what am I looking at on this build? Oh, I was totally negligent. I really did need to run two of those tests side by side. I don't think I have time right now, but when you run two tests and you store them someplace, like a database, um, for those results, and they're stored in a separate SQL Server database for the actual transactions, the aggregate data, the data that you saw, that I sh that you, that all of the data that you saw, 
that's stored as well in TFS. Um, however, the individual request data, that sort of stuff needs to be stored in a database. But you can look at any two database runs and compare them, and you actually now it has a, a comparison utility. It didn't have that before. That's a new 2010 thing that lets you, it's improved in 2010 to let you really compare two test runs. Um, not really. No. Um, the reports generally don't focus on load testing. All of that data is available. Um, so if you go into the cube, um, you can get load testing data and pull it out of the cube so you can get those results and do like over time results, those sorts of things as well. So the data is all available, but Microsoft didn't provide any built in out of the box reports that cover it. Somebody's got an Excel uh, spreadsheet somewhere around where they've done some of the slicing and dicing. Yep. Exactly. And, and I, I recommend taking that Excel spreadsheet and publishing those slice and dices out on as a portal page in SharePoint. So you can go look at that historical time as well graphically. Uh, just a second. I've got one more question that, that I, wa I want to grab and then I'll come back to yours. Just because flip flop on quest questioners. Um, rather than adding users, can we add tests for a single user to increase the load? You absolutely can. So if you want to, you're, you're feel, Steve, feel free to add more tests to a single user, but you don't really have to do that. You can simply just, um, to increase the load, just um, speed up your recorded think times, like cut them in half. Or you could get rid of your think times altogether, and that lets you do a very, very, very high load with very little amounts of users. Um, to give you an idea, when you get rid of recorded think times, um, you're going, you know, orders of magnitude faster. So you can, where you would normally be able to support maybe 100,000 users, you could overwhelm that site with 500 users or 1,000 users that you didn't have think time. That back to say, okay, I want to speed up think time by uh, a magnitude of 100. That way you have a known scale rather than just go as fast as possible. Yep, you can, you can speed it up by a factor of 100. You would have to actually write a little bit of code to do that. You would change your web test into a coded web test, or you would go edit the XML and just basically find every think time item and cut it by, you know, divide it by 100. So there's no way to do it in the, the thing without tree, either, either editing it, editing the XML of the, of the web test, or um, turning that web test into a coded web test, not a coded UI test, but a coded web test, and then going in and, and, and you could do your, your deltas there. Any last questions before we wrap up? Yeah, we've got all sorts of stuff that um, we've, we've shown tons of data, including uh, gathering IntelliTrace data and so forth. This is a lot of, of data that's being thrown in related to um, at attachments to uh, test results and so forth. Where do you start, how do you manage that data in PFS? In other words, if I've got a whole bunch of test runs with a whole bunch of IntelliTrace data that's really big, I'm going to probably pop the data store. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Let, let me give you just an idea for testers and for other folks. Um, and it's perfect because most of you have attended that one. Rule of thumb. Database growth was about one megabyte every other day. So basically, um, half of a megabyte per developer per day is what you could figure out your growth was going to be of your TFS server. You, so if you had 10 10 developers, your database was going to grow about 5 megabytes per day of average TFS usage, pretty aggressive TFS usage, at the high end. Um, what we're seeing is that for your testers, your database growth is anywhere from 50 to 100 megabytes per tester per day. That is a hundred times more data than a developer is throwing in there um, per day. Um, that's up until you start cleaning out your, your databases. And you really do need to clean out your databases. And how you do that is you create a query 
that shows you all of your closed bugs and then you run a little command line to go out and clean up your database and Brian Harry has a command line and I, I, I haven't seen it recently but it's a little command line that goes in and it cleans your 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 uh, um, your bugs you pass it a query it opens up those bugs and it goes and it deletes like things like the um, IntelliTrace files the any videos that you have running and any um, screenshots that you have against those um, you specify in the command line what you want to remove and it just removes those from the database so yeah so but if you if you're the type of company that has 25,000 bugs logged against it and you're just eventually going to get around to closing them Ooh, you're gonna have a really big sand. <laughs> so um, you do need to clean up, and that's the key: is to clean up those things. And you have a, you'll need to come up with a good query that will return the bugs that you want to clean up, and then keep that maintenance that's, going. That's right. Do those store stuff for any great amount of time? Do what? Do does what do that? Successful, successful test runs. Um, successful test runs are up to you. By default, they store videos and everything as well. Um, you can shut that down so they don't store videos, and I, I recommend that. I don't think successful test runs need videos um, in most cases. So, folks, I have got to wrap wrap this one up to uh, to head off. I have an, a, another meeting scheduled at t at ten thirty, so I'm going to, to need to kind of roll this one up. Um, we've kind of hit our time, but uh, uh, I'd love to continue talking with you and all of you. I know I have. Um, scheduled time or will have scheduled time for our one-on-one -on -one consult where I'll get to, to answer questions one-on-one -on -one and also kind of work with you on any questions that you have. So if you haven't scheduled that yet, please send an email to Amanda Jaworski, A-M-A-N-D-A -A -A dot J-A-W-O-R-S-K-I at nwcadence or almtraining.com or almtraining at nwcadence.com. That'll also work or myself, stephen.borg at nwcadence.com. And I look forward to uh, talking with you on your, your individual consults. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. And Zeph, I'm sorry to cut you off as I, as I, no as I wrap up.